On July 21, 1969, President Richard Nixon made the first phone call to the moon and addressed the two men in the Sea of Tranquility. Go ahead, Mr. President. This is Houston out. Hello, Neil and Buzz. I'm talking to you by telephone from the Oval Room at the White House. For every American, this has to be the proudest day of our lives. For one priceless moment in the whole history of man, all the people on this earth are truly one. One in their pride in what you have done. And one in our prayers that you will return safely to earth. Thank you, Mr. President. It's a great honor and privilege for us to be here representing not only the United States, but and a peace of all nations, and with interest and a curiosity, and, and with the vision for the future. An uh, honor for us to be able to participate here today. And thank you very much, and I look forward, all of us look forward to seeing you on the Hornet on Thursday. Look forward to that very much, sir. Not included in this message of greetings and congratulations from one heavenly body to another was Michael Collins. Orbiting 60 miles above the moon's surface, this Apollo 11 astronaut never got his boots dirty with moon dust. But his role as command module pilot was an essential role to the mission's success of the first moon landing. Sadly, Michael Collins passed away on April 28, 2021, at the age of 90. And while Michael Collins never left his boot prints on the lunar surface, he had a vital part in safely reaching and returning from the moon with all members of Apollo 11. Born in Rome, Italy on October 31, 1930, to Army officer James Collins and his wife Virginia Collins, a young Michael Collins would take his first plane ride aboard a Grumman Widgeon in Puerto Rico. Following a long line of family members who joined the armed services, Collins received an appointment to the United States Military Academy at West Point where he graduated 185th in his class of 527 cadets on June 3, 1952. Following graduation, Collins opted to join the U.S. Air Force and learned to fly in a T-6 Texan over the skies of Columbus, Mississippi. Eight years after graduation from West Point, Collins was admitted to the United States Air Force Experimental Flight Test Pilot School at Edwards Air Force Base in California. But how did all of this get him to the point of flying 60 miles above the moon? Well, in February of 1962, Collins was inspired, as were many in the world, by John Glenn's Mercury Atlas VI flight, which took Glenn around the Earth in orbit for 90 minutes. Following this, Collins applied for the second group of NASA astronauts, but was not accepted. A year later, NASA was looking for more astronauts, and Collins applied again. This time, he was accepted, along with another today well-known astronaut, Buzz Aldrin. Collins was not a rookie when he flew on Apollo 11. He had a previous space mission in the Gemini Project under his belt. 
Collins had joined John Young on Jiminy 10 in 1966, where they performed Rendezvous and Docking Test with an Agena target vehicle. During this mission, Collins became only the fourth astronaut to perform an EVA, and the first to perform more than one. Following his mission aboard Gemini 10, Collins was assigned first to the later cancelled Apollo 2 mission as a lunar module pilot, then to the Apollo 8 Prime crew as the command module pilot. But things would quickly change. During 1968, Collins began to notice that his legs were not working as they should. His knee would almost give out, and he had unusual sensations in his left leg. He was diagnosed with a cervical disc herniation, which required two vertebrae to be fused. This left Collins in a neck brace for three months and recuperating from between three to six months. As a result, Collins was bumped from the prime crew of Apollo 8. He was replaced by Jim Lovell, who, with Frank Borman and Bill Anders, would become the first humans to enter lunar orbit in December 1968. Following the successful circumlunar flight of Apollo 8, NASA announced the prime crew of Apollo 11, Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and Buzz Aldrin. It was not known at the time of the crew's announcement if they would, in fact, be the first crew to land on the moon, but they began training for that possibility. Collins' training was completely different from that of Armstrong and Aldrin. His primary focus was on the command module and the rendezvous with the lunar module following the completion of the moon landing. Collins is credited with compiling 18 different rendezvous plans for any scenario he and NASA could think of that might take place during redocking with the lunar module. Finally, on July 16, 1969, Armstrong, Collins, and Aldrin's mission would commence. After hours in simulators, calculating and recalculating trajectories, the countdown for the Apollo 11 mission began. With the world watching and seconds ticking down, fire burst from the Saturn V's five F-1 motors as the colossal 363-foot-tall rocket came to life. Smoke billowed as the rocket came off the pad, and liftoff took place at 9.32 a.m from pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Next stop, the moon. While Armstrong and Aldrin were busy with checks in preparation for their lunar landing, Collins had a different task to attend to. Collins was responsible for piloting the command module. Some of his tasks included serving as a flight engineer during liftoff, guidance and navigation, detaching the lunar module from the third stage of the Saturn V, turning the command module to dock with the lunar module. This maneuver done incorrectly could cause an in-space collision, which could decompress the cabin and bring the mission to an abrupt end. Controlling the command module alone while the other crew members were en route to or on the lunar surface. Being the middleman in the communication loop if Houston was not able to speak with the lunar module. Aligning the command module in the correct orbit or position to redock with the lunar module following the lunar descent or in case of an emergency. The command module pilot was also responsible for flying the craft through the atmosphere to a landing in the ocean. While Armstrong and Aldrin sailed off for their rendezvous with the lunar surface, Collins was left alone to man the command module, keeping it on the right course and properly working for the return flight home. The typical orbit of the moon would take about two hours, 46 minutes of which would take place behind the moon, out of signal range from the lunar module or Houston. During those 46 minutes, Michael Collins was the most isolated man in the world. 
In between his tasks, Collins found some time to jot down his thoughts about being alone. He said, I am alone now, truly alone, and absolutely isolated from any known life. I am it. If a count were taken, the score would be 3 billion plus 2 over on the other side of the moon, and 1 plus God knows what on this side. Many at the time took these remarks to mean Collins felt concerned about being so isolated. But in his book, Carrying the Fire, Collins shares additional thoughts he had on the flight. He said, Far from feeling lonely or abandoned, I feel very much a part of what's taking place on the lunar surface. I know that I would be a liar or fool if I said that I had the best of the three Apollo 11 seats. But I can say with truth and equanimity that I am perfectly satisfied with the one I have. This venture has been structured for three men, and I consider my third to be as necessary as either of the other two. He also said, I was the ticket home for Neil and Buzz. There is a more ominous connotation in Collins' writing than the average person might realize. While the previous mission Apollo 10 had been the dress rehearsal for the mission taking place, it was understood that the lunar landing portion of the mission had a 50-50 chance of working. During Apollo 10, the crew in the lunar module had only gone within 8.4 nautical miles of the lunar surface before redocking with the command module. There were still many unknown questions that only landing on the moon would answer. It was unclear how stable the ground was, and this was made worse by the fact that, due to a computer overload during the descent, Armstrong had flown past the original landing spot, and no one was certain about the terrain outside the lander. Among many concerns, another very pressing concern was whether or not the single ascent engine would be able to push the lunar module off the lunar surface and back up to the command module. It had been done in theory and simulators, but never in real life. Few people also realized that Richard Nixon had two speeches ready for the Apollo 11 mission, one of congratulations and one to the American people, telling them in part, these brave men, Neil Armstrong and Edwin Aldrin, know that there is no hope for their recovery, but they also know that there is hope for mankind in their sacrifice. This eventuality was not only top of mind for the President, Mission Control, and everyone at NASA, but it was a very possible outcome for the Command Module pilot sailing alone around the lunar sphere. This is what Michael Collins had to say about that possibility. If they fail to rise from the surface, or crash back into it, I am not going to commit suicide. I am coming home, forthwith. But I will be a marked man for life, and I know it. It is easy today to view missions to space as commonplace and normal. But for those who know the stories of Apollo 1, Challenger, and Columbia, and the 17 astronauts who lost their lives, we understand the danger that space missions entail. Just as the intrepid sailors and pioneers of olden years risked their lives to find new lands or make contact with distant countries, there is a risk involved. And all true explorers are aware of that risk. Still, they go to explore the unknown. When Eagle finally landed on the lunar surface, Michael Collins was behind the moon, unaware that the mission had almost been aborted due to the landing rays dark causing an onboard computer to crash. Armstrong had to take manual control of the lunar module, 
but they were now off course over a large crater he described as being filled with boulders the size of small cars. Six forward. 60 seconds. Lights on. Six. Down two and a half. Forward. Forward. Six. 40 feet down two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down. Great shadow. Four forward. Four forward, drift into the right a little. Ready? Down a half. 30 seconds. Forward, just. Good. Ready? Contact light. Okay, engine stop. APA at a descent. Auto descent. Coast control both auto descent engine command override off. Engine arm off. 413 is in. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. A few short hours later, Armstrong and Aldrin became the first humans to set foot on another heavenly body. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Back in the command module, Collins is told the lunar module landed off course and is given coordinates to attempt to spot it from space. But orbit after orbit, with new possible coordinates coming in, Collins was never able to spot the eagle in its nest on the surface of the moon. But 21 hours and 36 minutes later, after spending a total of 2 hours and 15 minutes on the moon's surface, Armstrong and Aldrin fired the ascent motor and much to the relief of all involved, the two astronauts were not stranded on the lunar surface, but with a sudden upward movement, they were on their way home. They successfully redocked with Columbia, and none of the 18 contingency plans Collins had so carefully prepared were needed. Collins does not recall what he first said to Neil and Buzz, but he told the New York Times in an article for the 50th anniversary his recollection about their appearance. They were dirty, he said, you know, from their knees down. Nice white suits had all this grimy goo on them from the rocks and dust on the moon. And I thought, oh, I'm going to bring that into the command module. I have to clean everything up. The crew made it safely back through the atmosphere, landing in the Pacific Ocean, where they were picked up by helicopter and flown to a quarantine trailer on board that already famous USS Hornet, which launched the Doolittle Raiders during World War II. There, they were greeted by President Nixon as they began their 21-day quarantine in the event they had been exposed to any harmful bacteria or other unknown elements on the moon. Following the 21 days quarantine, the festivities began, including a ticker tape parade in New York, an interview after interview with all forms of media outlets, including even a visit with the Queen of England, among other world leaders and dignitaries, following their return. Collins was offered a chance at commanding his own lunar mission, but he refused. Later, in 1969, he left NASA and was appointed the Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs before becoming the first director of the National Air and Space Museum in 1971. He would go on to write four books over the years. And if you ask people today who were the astronauts on Apollo 11, most can name Armstrong and Aldrin. They will be left scratching their heads or grabbing for their phones to search for the name of that third astronaut. <laughs>